if uh, and, and the um, meeting is being recorded and you will get access to these slides as well um lovely um and if you can't hear or see me just let me know valenza if you can let me know as well so thank you so um so what i wanted to talk about today is just a a a, 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 a sort of mixture of a general introduction to adhd and some very specific bits about the neurobiology some of the um i see a lot of faces i recognize lots of names i recognize here in the, in the list and thank you ever so much for for, for coming along um uh, some of you won't know me from clinic um but um, there are there often there often comes the time when I say, well, this this is the science bit, and because we have to get to the practical bits, this goes through quite quickly. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the neurobiology, um, and uh, I will try and make it as it is quite complicated. <laughs> um, and one bit I've had to practice, and I was base part of the brain, so it is clearly something that's kind of got, got under my skin a little bit. Um, also, um, just so if you wonder what that I picked right, um, and I've written a, a podcast on um, the, the re medical response and the nursing response and the porter's response to COVID, and it's called Unmasked. Um, just uh, if you want a little bit of extra extra stuff, um, and this is where I try to work out advance my slides. Um, Da, 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 da. That's not the unstable um, thing, that's me. Um, um, let me just go back. Sorry to hear what I think there is. Thing. There are these um, arrows on the lower left. There we go. There you go. <laughs> there we go. No, that was it. It was, just, it was a internet slow thing. Okay, so this is a, a little kind of meme here. This uh, this is a, a, a lovely little bit of um, uh, internet uh, 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 trivia stuff. This is uh, the Forever Spinning Kid. Uh, there's a little link on there if you click it, click it, click it on there. Um, there's basically um, a um, child who comes to the end of a go kart race um, and is making him herself spin. And then the clever people have put the Put the picture into various other um, circumstances and, and it just said to me about children with adhd that wherever you are they're always themselves um and they're they're often creative um often uh, noisy um uh, but always delightful um and uh, this child gets a round of applause at the end for just being so just stop now um, so this, I just wondered if this was you, and I, uh, because these are slightly adapted stories from patients I've heard in clinic, this may literally be you, and I do apologise, I've changed hopefully the, um, the circumstances, you won't recognise yourself too much. Um, so this is uh, two, two little stories, uh, one uh, family told me that um, shopping with their child with ADHD is very challenging because they're so interested in the environment around them, they, they want to explore everything, um, they jump onto the um, uh, uh, the the um, washing powder um, uh, shelves and jump out and surprise other people in the supermarket. Uh, so she has to go early in the morning. She can only go when there's a security guard that uh, they know by name and the security guard will allow them um, to um, go into the shop um, and not tell them off when they are very noisy and very creative. So this family's had to change their life around the opening hours of this particular supermarket and the shift patterns of the particular security guard in order, in order to be able to shop. The other one that um, made me laugh in the, the clinic the other day, uh, I've got a picture of Judy Dench here from um, James Bond, uh, head of the spies. Um, this is a, a child who's transitioning into secondary school um, and the mum is very worried about um, his ability to be independent, tra be an independent traveller. So what she did for the first week was she, uh, she wore a disguise and followed him onto the bus um, and followed him down the road into school just to make sure that he was doing okay. And, and the good news was, he was okay, uh, some slightly hairy mo moments at the, the roadside, um, but she just wanted to make sure. Um, and, and again, there are other challenges around transition and around our confidence around our children. Um, uh, so just a little bit of history. Um, and I just wanted you to have a little look at this picture, um, just particularly look at the face. Uh, so this is an old picture, it's from the 1870s. Um, and as you can see, uh, they haven't been really been able to focus on the face particularly well because she was moving so much. When I go to conferences, I always go to the local museum. Um, this was in Cambridge. This was a, a, a little exhibition about children who were put into asylums or prisons for their behaviour. 
and obviously I won't read this all out because you're going to get the, the slides, but this was Dangerous Alice in 1887 and she was seven years of age um, and she was admitted to the, the workhouse um, because she was continually moving about, screaming, breaking windows, requires constant watching, biting other children, tearing her clothes to rags, in danger of killing herself or other children. And she's been in this state from birth. She was described as uh, extremely self-willed, um, self um, uh, picks up bad language and bad habits uh, readily. Um, and uh, although she sort of put on weight, this to describe her as, as gaining flesh, um, she remained a challenge. Uh, unfortunately, she, she did had a rather short life, um, but uh, uh, she was, but throughout this described tempered and swearing, uh, but very active. So these are, I thought it was really important to point out that um, this is a condition that affects both boys and girls. It's pervasive um, It's and it's been with us for years. It isn't a new phenomenon. It's something that we've, uh, we've always had, but like so many things has been so badly defined. Um, and when it, with uh, the condition comes the medications, um, it isn't, and I, I, that's, I always find that very interesting because you don't have to be on the medications, absolutely not. But very fascinating that the, the, the development of medicines came at the time when things were, 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 were the, the, the medicines were developed often before you knew what you, you needed them for. So Ritalin, uh, which is the American brand name of methylphenidate, was around for many, many years in forms of, of, uh, of um, various forms of amphetamines, which we used, and there's a picture here of uh, the, the, the uh, amphetamines that were used uh, during the Second World War to, to stimulate soldiers. Um, but there's uh, the many faces of, of medication. Are you a, a withdrawn person, a very active person, somebody of, uh, uh, with depression? Um, uh, and there's been a sort of coming together of, of the medication and uh, ADHD management in a really in a way that I hope's been really really helpful. And again, again, I just love the picture of the boy here with his shaking head. Look very similar to that picture of the child in the 1870s. Um, so the impression that a lot of people have about ADHD, about the medicines, etc., is, is is in popular culture everywhere. So we've got the Simpsons here. We've got um, we've got Time magazine. Uh, this is from um, uh, this is from Kimmy Schmidt, I think. Discipline, the name of the, the medicine there. Um, so a lot of people know an awful lot, uh, but uh, times the impressions that we have are um, not always completely uh, completely uh, uh, right. Um, because the impression that a lot of people have is that this is a condition that's, that's a societal thing, it's a made up thing, it's something that, that this medicine's been created to, to, to kind of to, to fix, um, but it's more complicated than that. So just a little, little background, I'm sure absolutely you guys know all about this, it's a lifelong condition, it affects about 5% of the population. Um, there's a multimodal etiology. That means there's lots of different things that contribute. Environmental triggers, uh, triggers are important, and that's why I ask about uh, maternal smoking and drinking during pregnancy. <coughs> I always preface that by saying I always ask this because I don't want anyone to be offended by those questions, but they are important. Comorbid with um, autism, about 30% of cases and a number of your uh, children will have both um, or one, but we're talking about ADHD particularly today. Um, and it isn't just the condition, it leads on to secondary uh, complicated behaviours particularly. Um, we'll talk a tiny bit about that. And diagnosis from collateral, that means I need as much information as from many people as possible in order to make the diagnosis. Um, and we often run into the, we can't get information from schools, although schools are, are doing the right, up, absolute best in the last few months. Um, and hopefully we'll talk about that and there's a little section I've called frustration about today about you sort of waiting times, how to make that most useful. Lots of famous people uh, have aligned themselves with the diagnosis. Lots of people may have had and, and didn't know about it, Mozart there. Um, and very recently, uh, yesterday I was reading uh, Sean Ryder, any other 90s indie music fans here? Sean Ryder from the Happy Mondays. Um, lots of uh, very unwise drug related behaviors in his life and he's now being diagnosed with ADHD. Adrian Charles, very, uh, very well-known presenter and writer as well. Uh, we need more women to represent um, uh, ADHD as well, but there's lots of role models, positive and negative <laughs> for ADHD out there as well. Okay, so let's think about that neurobiology. Um, and again, I, I'm, I, I've prefaced that a little bit to say that this is a little bit complicated 
it, but I'll, I'll kind of go into it in a little bit of detail for you. And you've got it there because the thing that is most frustrating, I think, for a lot of people coming in for the first review, first diagnosis is why is there no blood test? Why is there no scan? And particularly when you're talking to relatives, I've heard this quite a few times, is it'd be really helpful if I could show somebody, demonstrate to somebody what this is, because particularly with all that background, although we know it's something that's been around for a long time, isn't this surely something that that is just created because of because of you know screens and TV and our poor attention spans? I'm going to spoiler this uh, this section now and say unfortunately there are still no uh, scans or blood tests that are regularly available. I can't write to get you one unfortunately now, although. I'm sure if I did a lot of scans, um, I would probably find demonstrable differences from the neurotypical brain. Um, and, and that's what uh, research is showing and it's it's continue, continuing to research. So, so from, from some of the early studies through to this little collection here from 2009 onwards, um, there is these demonstrable changes from reduction in brain matter generally, but particularly in the PFC or the prefrontal cortex. And I'm sure you've read an awful lot about it. And uh, in that picture there, you can see right at the front of the brain. And that's a really interesting part of the brain because it's developing right into those mid twenties, right into that time where you want children and young people to be independent. Um, there's a reduction in uh, a little bit of the grey matter, which is right in the middle of the brain. We'll talk about how important that is. Ventral striatum, which is a part of the brain that links reward and hyperactivity. And it's called striatum because it's stripy. Um, so it's striated. Um, and, and that's because it's got lots of dopamine in. And when dopamine uh, degrades, it's brown, it's melanistic. So if you have uh, somebody with Parkinson's, for example, that condition, which is so awful, it, it, it's, um, if you think of uh, Michael J. Fox, he has a variation on this. He finds it very difficult to, to move spontaneously, trembles a lot. If you look at the brain of somebody with Parkinson's disease, they, they have signs of, of this degrading dopamine either. Uh, uh, so they don't have these sort of stripy bits because they don't have that dopamine left. Um, so we know that uh, the DRD4 um, gene links to the thickness of this, and I'll come back to that. And if you do what's called fusion transfer uh, imagery in the front and the cerebellar pathways, that's reduced. So you have a brain that is slightly underdeveloped or developed in a slightly different way. Um, and it's not just that front of the brain, but right down to the back of the brain. Just that little bit about the front part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. Um, anybody that's uh, done any psychology, um, the Phineas Gage, very famous uh, for him in 1860. Um, he was uh, making the, uh, the railways in, the, in America, uh, was damping down the explosive that has to go into the rocks in order to explode the rocks to, to, to make the pathway for the, for the railway. Um, and he had a damping iron um, and there was a spark as the metal was going past the, the, the stone and and the, 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 the damping on his jaw out through his eyes, you can see from the picture there here and, and, and uh, d disconnected part of the front of his brain. Now, um, the story then sort of becomes a little bit more, um, more co uh, confusing. This sort of story that we all learned is that this is a lovely guy um, who was very self-controlled, very uh, you know, amiable, suddenly became very overexcitable, a little bit hypersexual, uh, I guess got himself into all sorts of trouble. Um, and for years and years, everyone thought, well, that's because of the prefrontal lobe itself was, uh, was damaged. Now, the story itself is not quite that clear because actually he made his name then from demonstrating, as you can see from this picture, very posed. These ex pictures would have been expensive. Um, so he made his, la his fortune going to uh, demonstrations and fairs and things like that. So perhaps the story isn't quite as we know it. But what we do know is that frontal part of the brain, which was thought to be just sort of nobody really knew what it was for, is really important in our control mechanisms. And this is the part of the brain that is particularly affected in ADHD. But it's not quite as simple as that because it's to do with the connections between the front of the brain and the back of the brain and the cerebellum. Um, 
so the prefrontal cortex helps us concentrate when things are boring and that's what happened to Phineas Gage if he lost his interest in something you would go and find something else to do it suppresses irrelevant information so if your frontal lobes are not working as well as they could do little bits of trivia pop into your mind things will distract you it filters out external distractions so again it's that classical thing about with ADHD is if something else pops into your field of vision or in your child's field of vision they're then distracted by that and it's been particularly that's been the case with the COVID homeschooling I've heard this over and over again working from home is hard because something else would happen as a younger sibling would say something and it's the prefrontal lobe is not on on game so if you can't multitask which is what the prefrontal lobe does you can't complete a task and very importantly integrates with your sensory cortex so your understanding of the environment around you helps you concentrate helps you uh, helps you with that function and we know that a number of our children have sensory um, problems particularly those with asd but also children with adhd they're often sensory seeking they're often looking out for things that they can touch and sniff or they get overwhelmed they get overheated um the story i hear over and over again this is the children takes their take their clothes off everywhere they come home from the end of the school day off to go the clothes trying to stop them do this in the middle of the supermarket again knowing your local security guard really really helps but again it's not just being impulsive it's to do with the way that the brain is integrating with the rest of the, the, the brain that if you are overwhelmed by sensation much easier if you take your clothes off um, and also emotional and sensory or social immaturity leads into that so you've got two ways that the brain functions it's from the top down and the bottom up so um, in terms of your um, understanding the environment that affects the way that your brain will function so if you uh, are um, unable to monitor those signals that are coming in from the front of the brain you're unable to control your your mechanisms that just snap into action and you may have heard of the amygdala it's a little bit of a gray matter right in the middle of the brain that looks like an almond and that helps you understand threat and it's monitoring us all of the time so anybody that's been exposed to any traumatic situations your amygdala is often just on guard all of the time so post-traumatic stress um, can be linked in again with adhd in as much as it just sends you off into reactive situations quite a lot. And I know, unfortunately, a lot of our families have experienced PTSD, are very well aware of that. Um, and it can link in with some of the aggressive behaviors. So again, um, I don't want to overstate, this is just a sort of theory of my own. Again, if when children have been told off a lot in the classroom, they often react in a very aggressive way. So they, a lot of children will say they feel they're being treated unjustly. And I think if they're starting to understand that they've been treated unjustly, it can make them overreact. And I think that kind of overreaction is very much because of that linking with the center part of the brain, your hypothalamus tells you, it tells your thyroid, thyroid when to go, it tells you, tells your, your, your body when to be ready and to, to, um, to react to things. So I think that the two are very much in, interrelated. The parietal lobe helps us understand time and space. Um, and children with ADHD are often quite clumsy, they often blunder into situations, they're often quite impulsive. Um, and that's in part because of those parts of the brain are interacting together. But it also helps us remember where we put things. And there's a little bit extra on the executive dysfunction because that is arguably one of the most important things about ADHD. If your prefrontal lobe is not functioning as well as it can be, just losing things is just part of your day-to-day -day life. You put things down, your understanding of where things are in space just goes. And when you see it with children, they just don't know what they've done with things. You know, where's your toothbrush? It's right in front of you. If you haven't got that sensory integration, it's really hard to remember what it is that you're meant to be doing. Okay, so that executive function, it is very, very complicated, which is why it's so difficult to manage. So it's a, it's a balance between your understanding. And again, nobody's doubting that uh, children with ADHD and, and young people and adults are not as bright or in many ways brighter than other people. Your cognitive understanding of where things should be doesn't link in with the rest of your brain, where your brain knows things should be. So you are um, you're just in this sense, this sense of um, not being able to monitor and not being able to use your understanding to, um, to know where, how to plan things. Now, this bit here, I had to uh, write this out. And I, again, this is something I've spent a lot of time trying to think about um, how to say properly. Um, we have a complex way of resting our brains. OK, so um, when we are resting our brains, we are what's called non-resting um uh we're called resting and our alert brains are non-resting um 
And when you're, you've got ADHD, you have an inability to manage that. So what happens is you are not, not alert. And that means you're often over alert. So these are children that can't filter out signals. So you can't, you can't get the brain to, to, to slow itself down. So that mechanism is slowing your brain down. So these are kids whose brains are often on the go, literally on the, on the go all the time. Okay, so this is just a demonstration of what happens over time. So um, you start to develop those pathways start to develop a lot more when you're when you're older. And this is a, the difference between white matter and gray matter. So in the healthy control here, you, we, we should have a lot more white matter than in the ADHD, ADHD brain. It's just that little bit more immature. So even into 18, into 25, you're starting to make those changes, but you're um, not actually quite there. And um, this should be a, um, a slide that moves, but I, I took a picture in a conference, so I apologize, it's not as exciting as it was in the conference, but it's just a demonstration is that the brain is changing. Um, so a little bit about the role of neurotransmitters, because that's so important for the medicines that we use. So basically the two main neurotransmitters that we think about in the brain for ADHD are dopamine and noradrenaline, and they are probably one of the, the most representative in the, in the brain. There's also glutamate, and there's some work going on ahead looking at glutamate, and again, looking at medications. But essentially, they are, they are, dopamine is there for your motor, cognitive, and emotional functions, and you have five receptors in the synapse. Um, so a D1 uh, prunes out neuronal signals to reduce noise. So too much stimulation in the brain just overwhelms the brain. And again, that's what happens in ADHD. And again, these are um, also uh, um, neuronal receptors that respond to reward. And this is why children have these difficulties because you've just not got that responsive brain in quite the same way, but they respond to reward. So the story I hear a lot is he concentrates on things that he likes or she plays games and she's really good at her gaming, but can I get her to do her homework? No, because we ha you have a relatively less response to dopamine, but the ones that respond to reward still are still going. Noradrenaline is a little bit more uh, um, subtle, um, and again, it's, it sort of sits mostly in the prefrontal lobes, and actually it's a little bit more difficult to manipulate. So again, for those people who are taking non-stimulant medicine, a little bit longer to work, why the medicine is not quite as effective is because the noradrenaline is, is again, a little, bit, a little bit more subtle, a little bit harder to get to right in the front of the, front of the brain. So here's a little schematic of the, the, the nerve endings. And uh, we've got labeled up the, the, the receptors there in the dopaminergic nerves and also the noradrenaline nerves and a, a balance between signal and noise. So often I talk about a a radio being detuned and that's the direct response of these. This is the direct res um, result of these, these, uh, um, these chemicals. So what happens essentially with the brain with ADHD is you've got something that is too noisy and something sometimes that's out of tune. So what we need to do in our management is try and get those things sort of settled down a little bit. And it's all to do with the nerves and it to do with the way that those chemicals are starting to have that effect. So a really quick rundown is, or at least what I'll do is I'll leave this for you to look. There are several, several types of theories for what's happening, but essentially is you have abnormalities in the transfer of those chemicals. Um, you have a brain that is not quite vigilant enough and or sometimes over vigilant. Your reward circuits are not strong enough for your executive dysfunction. So you, you executive function, so you lose things along the way. You need to have rewards in order to stop yourself feeling horrible. Um, you generally your brain is, is underpowered, but it's affecting the whole brain and the whole brain from top to top to bottom. Okay. So are there any tests yet? The answer is no, not yet. Some of you would have had uh, gone through a QB test or your children would have had a QB test. Um, and this is, uh, again, I've got a picture of this. This is uh, you, you sit in front of a screen, you have a headband, and um, the camera will record your facial you know, movements, so your eye movements essentially, and you're given a, a, a boring task to do. And there's some um, little just sort of representations of the of the graphs that come out, um, and then rather pleasing, it's combined with a uh, with a snap questionnaire, um, and then they come up with a dashboard of whether you're more likely to have ADHD. 
we don't use it at, um, at um, St George's. We we talk about it a lot, and we kind of have the QB question that comes up every now and again in our in our group. We take it to the uh, neuropharmacology group, which is a national group as well, and we just kind of watch and see what's happening. I know they're very keen on this in the South Coast. Um, I know if you've seen a private educational psychologist, they will sometimes do this test. It takes about ninety minutes to do. Um, what it does do is it helps with diagnostic confidence. So if we've got somebody we're not quite sure about whether they're dis distractible or whether they're working so hard. So we've got somebody, for example, who comes to a clinic, um, they sit there beautifully reading a book um, and the, 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 the school report or the parents reports are like, well, we're not quite sure. Um, we, we, they're just not doing quite so well in a class. Um, but they're, they're behaving so well and they're, they're apparently concentrating, but they're not performing. This is where a QB test would be useful. Um, what we had until fairly recently was our school observations. Unfortunately, we've had to pause those because of staffing and also because of the COVID um, uh, incident, uh, COVID pandemic. But we're, we're rethinking that. And that's the watching the children while they're doing something that they're not enjoying and seeing what happens. Um, so this. This is a, a, a connectivity study um, a, a schematic and a, again we're about I still think we're about seven years off before we can offer those tests I think they're coming but not quite yet okay so how do we manage ADHD and just a quick run through and again some of you may be new parents uh, for this um, for those of you who are very familiar with this um, I, I rely on Centalk and your, your amazing collective uh, brains um, and you're in, and you're in you're very um, curious and uh, uh, interesting um, thoughts on uh, on different methods and, and I think we're going to come to an idea of a roadmap in a minute but essentially bottom line is education the more you understand about ADHD which is why I'm here today the better are you managing your own ADHD if that's you but managing your children's um, ADHD and if you're a, a relative or well, those are not directly involved um, again supporting the family to understand what ADHD is the best thing that we can do for our families um, generally is uh, to look at the uh, to identify the difficulties but also look at the positives because I think as parents it's exhausting having somebody with ADHD a lot of the time because um, often what you're hearing is lots of negative things and again, for those of you who know me, including I think I'm forever looking for the you do, but the support that other organisations can provide. Because if a child is hearing positive things, then it helps them concentrate. It helps with that reward circuit. If you're hearing no, 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 um, then that's quite tough. And it actually, it, it, it doesn't doesn't help with your neuronal development positive parenting strategies. Um, again, a lot of the parenting courses have had to go on hold because of COVID. Um, and there are, there are uh, organisations uh, such as Contact as well that you'll be aware of had been running running the 123 Magic course. Um, my little, I have a little note here somewhere, is it gone? Here we go. I've had a little note written by one of my colleagues about the 123 Magic course and it says, send talk can we talk about the one two three magic course so maybe we'll come to that and whether uh, we can use your collective skills to perhaps think about whether you can perhaps become partners in the one two three magic course running anyway that's just seeding that idea school interventions how do we involve our schools what do the schools do um, we have some information that we send to the schools um, schools can take that or leave that they have very much their own uh, plans um, immediate reinforcement of behaviour uh, and a lot of what uh, is so important for our kids is uh, feeding back as soon as possible because as you can see you lose that thread really really quickly and again that's some of the uh, some of the difficulties with what schools have to be able to do things like isolation and exclusions become very difficult for the children to understand because they have uh, they're being told no or, or, or having a behaviour uh, reprimanded and um, that behavior is long long gone before something happens um, executive function measures how do you support executive functions um, I talk a lot about uh, reminders um, you I know use lots of charts and things anything that helps uh, your yourself and I think the, the thing I'd say a lot about the executive function is give yourself a break plan as much as you can but but um, it's hard work uh, planning and remembering things um, uh, it's habits and muscle memory a lot of the time Environmental measures help with sleep and well-being. Out lots of letters to housing. Uh, for those of you who are in difficult housing situations, my um, my heart goes out to you. Always, um, the Wandsworth has been struggling for a long, long while with their housing. I don't want to make a political point about this, but um, I'm, I'm important. It's really important that your children have a, the appropriate environment for them to be able to get the, get sleep. 
um, and I will will uh, go into a battle on your behalf uh, to try and help you to get the appropriate housing, uh, but I can't promise. Um, pharmacological, omega-3, omega-6 oils. Um, uh, where have I got? I'm at my desk. Here we go. What do I take every morning? I take Sainsbury's Best. Does it help me? Possibly. Again, does it help? Possibly. I've got a medical student writing an essay on this to look at the evidence. Um, well, um, most people get along with them and, and won't do any harm, um, mostly. Stimulant medications, we can talk a little bit about that. Non-stimulant medications and new technologies such as brain training. Um, and for those of you who've been working with me on a project on this, we're on hold at the moment, but um, looking at brain training, neurofeedback, I think it's quite that's an exciting um, non-pharmacological um, thing for the future. Um, and that's it here. So I'm working with this uh, group called um, um, Cortex. Um, we're at the moment trying to get an app through um, uh, St. George's that uh, um, the Cortex are um, uh, trying to uh, you pilot a free trial where we it's a way of interacting with, with you. We, I send you an app, you send the information and we work together on that. I'd just like to say at this point, I don't get any financial reward from this company. It's uh, I'm just working with them because I think they're very interesting, a very interesting neuro, a neurotech startup. And that's the, the game that they are using called Zip and the Misty Mountain. Um, it's a way of helping children understand the concentration. There are games like this available. Other games are available. Um, uh, there's one in America that's now being used again as a treatment uh, for children with ADHD. Um, we were the study that I was doing um, again paused is to, to look at the evidence around um, um, a scoring on the various scores that we can use um, after using the game. So that's the that's what we hope we'll be able to pick up again um, soon. So a, little, a tiny bit about the service uh, for those of us, those of you who know me know as well. We have around about a thousand children in the Wandsworth service. The reason we have that many is that I, once I've diagnosed a child, I will keep them in my service until they're 18. Not all services are able to offer that. Um, it just means that we do sometimes get a little um, busy, as you uh, know. But we have around about 400 new uh, referrals a year. Um, we try and move things as fast as we can. Um, and uh, the way that we do that is our, the first point of contact with us is what's called the early intervention clinic. Where you We'll talk to one of our nurses and we've been trained uh, if you've anyone's met uh, the lovely dr osman um she's now doing diagnostic work for adhd as well and we have dr desmerch as well who is our developmental lead and also does adhd as well and we have a multidisciplinary team for those of who knew uh, dr daphne keen uh, she still sees some patients but she is now re retired um uh, semi-retired uh, uh, um, but it, it's still working exceptionally hard so um the number of new patients i saw in the last year went up by 39 percent uh, which is it was phenomenal and that's because people were at home so i did home-based clinics um telephone video based clinics um, um and i'm delighted that people were able to do that um so, uh, and we have two nurses, uh, we're hoping to get a third, um, and I'm hoping to start work with a prescribing pharmacist um, in clinic as well, but again, trying to work out the funding streams for that. Also psychology, we lost psychology due to funding, um, and working very hard to try and get psychology back into our services as well. Okay, so I talked way longer than I should have done, uh, way longer. In fact, it's only 15 minutes for a chat. Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I should have warned you. I talk a lot. Um, uh, so I've got some discussion points. Um, so um, I've got about 10 discussion points, but we can stop, start wherever. Um, diagnostic labels was my first one. So I've talked a lot about diagnosis. Um, how do we talk to our children? Um, should this be directed uh, by families or clinicians? And how do we as clinicians and parents share information with schools that's in a way that's helpful to ch children? So again, just that point I made about schools do their own thing and rightly they should, their education, I'm health. We all work together, but um, how do uh, we as clinicians, how do we as parents share that information with schools? The, th the thing I hear a lot is, they don't know he's got ADHD. Even if, I, if I've written to the school as the doctor, um, their class teacher doesn't know, or um, secondary school, their geography teacher doesn't know. 
um, how do we share that information with the schools in the most useful way and how and again we're using the children as well how do we help children understand young people understand do we want to have them as their their ambassadors do they say i'm sorry i've got adhd can you slow down please or do we want them to feel protected from this what do you think just to speak up okay i'm going to be stopping the recording just to, just because we're starting on a